How do you remember your first kiss for the rest of your life? This is a journey through the brain to genome, to ocean, and back to clinics. All big cycle of life. It will help us to uncover one of the greatest mystery in the universe and one of the most complex machinery on this planet, our brain. When we were talking about studying long-term memory, I didn't think about Palm Beach. Well, it's memorable, isn't it? But we're really here to meet Andrea Cohn and Leonard Moros. Leonard's just back from a long trip all the way from Panama, and they collected samples along the way. I'm dying to see what they got. How do you study long-term memory? One of the most stable molecules in our body is uh, DNA. We did direct single cell genomic analysis of these circuits before, during, and after simple memory formation. Within um, half an hour, significant fraction of the DNA chemically modified. That is really incredible. So we went to the sea. We picked up an organism which has a very really simple neural system. This is a sea slug aplysia. And the uh, beauty of this creature, it has beautifully colored large neurons. So how are neurons different? Our data shows that neurons are different not only because they have different functions. Neurons are different because they have different genealogies. They have different evolutional histories. Neurons which are superficially similar, genetically remarkably different, different neurons of memory circuits learn differently. So we looked at two neurons and we studied how they aged. As they aged, they became totally different from each other. This gives us a lot of information about what could be happening in our brains as we age. One of the first animals we looked at were the tinafores or comb jellies. They have enormous combs that they move through the water and they're iridescent so that they refract light and that's what gives them their color. These atenophores have got no neurotransmitters like we have. These guys develop neural system independently from us. For the vast majority of neurotransmitters, they don't have transmitters like serotonin, dopamine, noradrenaline, acetylcholine. So you have real alien neural system in our seas. It seems like there must have been a very, very ancient ancestor. One of the early branching animal lineage one of the descendants for most ancient animal lineage of our planet. They are branched from um, our common ancestor earliest, so they may be even sister group for the rest of the animals. They reinvented a lot of stuff themselves. The beautiful solutions for very complex uh, problems. How do you study RNA modifications? What's really critical is that we really need to go to a single nucleotide level. We need to be able to find that exact modification and that specific gene and, and what that modification actually does to its function. This is, this is really what's, what's key. Modifications are very um, conserved across nature. So we can literally sit there and 100% of the time, statistically, predict what neuron we actually have by looking at its modifications. Could you describe more of these RNA modifications for us? There's chemical modifications, and then there's um, RNA editing. The RNA modifications change the chemical memory of RNA by adding something like a methyl group to adenosine. This will change the whole chemical environment of this molecule. The RNA editing will change basically one nucleotide side to another, and usually it's like an adenosine to an inosine. And so these are almost like a patterned kind of modification that you can literally follow.
So how are you going to search for more animals in, in what you call the laboratory of nature? I do believe within five, 10 years, we can get an entire genomic blueprint of our ocean. There are some animals have no cancers. There are some animals which do not age much. There are some neurons which do not age much. This has to be studied on the level of very, very specific cells. So we estimate that there is about 40 million uh, biologically active compounds, which probably still await its discovery. Our big mission is, is to be able to educate the public about what we're doing. And we couldn't have done any of this without our funding sources, such as NIH, NASA, and NSF. This is really what drives us. And when you just start to work with this, uh, you will see how people get engaged. I mean, just even if you love art, sometimes what you can just really see under the microscope virtually impossible to even imagine. How can you translate the results on these animals to mammals? 70% of the genes are actually the same 70% that are in, in, in humans. Well, this also give you insight into neurodegenerative diseases and things like that. It does. What is missing is early diagnostic and detections. We need to detect early event. What's the probability that these discoveries will transfer into human health? 100%. You know, I never fully realized the complexity of ocean life at a molecular level. It's like looking into evolution's workshop. Yes, and I like the idea that the ocean holds the key to understanding how neurodegenerative diseases work. You know, if you don't know how it works, you can't fix it. Yeah, and with aging populations, it's becoming an important issue.